Hello guys, a very good morning. Uh, this is Dr. Chandni here for Area Plexus INICT Hackathon. Since this is going to be a high yield session, we are just going to revise all the topics and we are going to cover as much as possible. Okay, so now I have made a list of the important topics that has been asked in the previous three years. Okay, so this is for the previous three years. So if you see here, uh, the most common topics that has been repeated is from newborn. So they've asked almost nine questions from newborn and then renal seven, hematology, almost six questions. And uh, from growth and development, if you see every year, at least one question from growth and development has been asked. So we'll try to cover as much as possible from these important topics, okay? So we'll start with few questions. The first question is, alternate procedure for height measurement in a five-year-old child. So how to measure height in a five-year-old child? So the options they have given is arm span, crown rump length, head circumference, and knee height. So coming to the last option, what about knee height? Can we use knee height for height measurement? Yes, but then it is not an accurate measurement. And this is used only in bedridden patients who are bedridden. Okay, so this option is not the answer. Coming to head circumference, we all know head circumference has nothing to do with the height of the child. Crown rump length is used for estimation of fetus. It is not used in children. Now coming to arm span, yes, arm span approximately equals to height by 10 years of age. So arm span approximately equals to height around 10 years of age. So what is arm span? How to measure arm span? Arm span is measured when you ask the patient to outstretch their arms and then you measure from the tip of one middle finger to the tip of the other middle finger. So around 10 years, what happens is that it corresponds to the height of the child. So what is the significance of arm span? In case of Marfan syndrome, you all know Marfan syndrome. So the feature of Marfan syndrome is the child will be very tall, it will have very long and slender fingers. So in Marfan syndrome, what happens is that the arm span is more than the height. So this is significant in case of Marfan syndrome. Okay. So now we'll see some of the growth parameters and it's important so you all tell me what is this first image this first image is it's nothing but an infantometer okay it is an infantometer so what is the use of this infantometer it is used to measure length in children less than two years of age clear coming to the next image what is that that is called as a stadiometer so what is the significance and use of stadiometer? This is used to measure height in children more than two years. So if you see here, for less than two years, you call it as what? You call it as length. And you use infantometer. For more than two years, you call it as what? Height. And you use stadiometer. So these are the equipment that is used to measure height in children. Okay. Coming to the normal height. So what is the normal length at birth? How much is a newborn's length? So normal length at birth is somewhere around 50 centimeters. By one year, it becomes 75 centimeters. So there is an increase in 25 centimeters by one year of age. Then two years, it is very simple, plus 12.5. So this is somewhere around 87.5 in two years. So after that, the formula is 6x plus 77. Here, x corresponds to age in years. So you will use the formula to know the actual or the expected weight of the child, height of the child. Okay. So if you see here, when does a child reach half of its adult size? That was a previous year repeat question. So when does a child reach half of the adult size? So it is around two years the child reaches half of adult size. 
so half of adult size is reached by 2 years clear this is about the height okay now the next parameter weight so how to measure weight what is this this is an infant weighing scale used for children who cannot stand on a weighing scale you use this to make them lie down or sit so this is an infant weighing scale the next one is the digital weighing scale that we all use so this is a digital weighing scale okay so what is the normal birth weight somewhere more than 2.5 kg is normal less than 2.5 kg you call it as low birth weight okay so what happens after birth there is a loss of weight for the first 10 days how much is acceptable 10 percentage of loss is acceptable and by 10 days the baby will regain birth weight okay so it will lose its birth weight and then it will regain birth weight by 10 days then what happens after that the baby will start increasing weight okay so baby doubles birth weight by five months by five months the baby would have doubled its birth weight triples the birth weight by one year quadruples the birth weight by two years okay so this is important doubles five months triples one year and quadruples by two years this is regarding the weight of the child okay the next parameter what is this this was also asked uh, in previous INICET. what is this this is nothing but shakti's tape this is called as shakti's tape what is the significance of shakti's tape this is used to measure what mid-arm circumference this is used to measure mid-arm circumference you can see this as how many colors that's like your traffic signal this has three colors so this is a color coded tape to measure the mid-arm circumference so you use this and see what way the child falls if it is in the green zone okay if it's a green zone it means it is more than it is more than what it is more than 13.5 centimeter and it is normal if it is in the yellow zone it means it is around 11.52 sorry 12.11.5 to 12.5 it means it is moderate malnutrition whereas in the red zone it means it is less than 11.5 centimeters and it is severe malnutrition okay so green yellow red normal moderate and severe malnutrition this you should know this is used for measuring midam circumference clear okay the next instrument what is this this is called as Harpenden caliper. Harpenden caliper. What is the use of Harpenden caliper? It is used to measure skin fold thickness. Skin fold thickness. Where do you measure skin fold thickness? In the triceps. Okay. This is where you measure the skin fold thickness. And something about the head circumference. So, how do you measure head circumference? Using measuring tape. So, you use measuring tape and you measure what? You will measure the occipital frontal diameter. Okay. Occipit and the frontal diameter you will measure using crossing over method. Okay. So measuring tape is used. Occipital frontal diameter using crossing tape method. So normal head circumference at birth is somewhere around 35 centimeters. What is the significance of head circumference? The maximum of the head circumference that is around 85 percentage of your adult head size is reached by it's reached by two years. By two years, 85 percentage of your head circumference is reached. Clear? Yeah. Okay. What is microcephaly? Yes. What is microcephaly? When head circumference is below minus three standard deviation, you call it as microcephaly. What is macrocephaly? When head circumference is more than two standard deviation, you call it as macro micro is minus three macro is two okay so now we have uh, consolidated and studied all the growth parameters okay now going to this what is sam sam is sam is severe acute malnutrition sam is severe acute malnutrition so what is the who criteria for sam WHO criteria for SAM is you have three points. What is the first point? Weight for height. 
it is weight for height remember this it is not weight for age it is not height for age it is weight for height below minus 3 standard deviation first point second point mid upper arm circumference less than 11.5 cm third point presence of bifidal edema presence of bifidal edema anyone is enough to say sam okay so uh, the only exception is in children less than 6 months you do not use this mid arm circumference like criteria okay other than that for all children from 6 months to 5 years this criteria is applicable for less than 6 months alone mid arm circumference is not included in the criteria so this is the criteria for sam I'm coming to the treatment of SAM. So, what are the two phases in the treatment of SAM? First phase is stabilization. First, you want to stabilize the patient who is sick. The next phase is rehabilitation. Rehabilitation. So, stabilization phase is the first one week. Okay. The first one week is your stabilization phase. And then for two to four weeks is your rehabilitation phase. So, how many steps are there in treatment of STEM? How many? 10 steps. A total of 10 steps. We'll just see the heading alone. What are the steps? Okay. The first step is you have to treat hypoglycemia. So, they will be sick, right? So, the first hypo you're going to treat is hypoglycemia. The second hypo you're going to treat is hypothermia. So, two hypos. Hypoglycemia, hypothermia. After correcting this, you will correct dehydration. So, after correcting glucose, after correcting temperature, then you correct the volume. So, you correct dehydration. The fourth thing is, after correcting dehydration, you want to correct electrolyte imbalance. So, you give electrolytes. Electrolyte imbalance. And then you start them to treat on infections. You treat infections. So, after taking all this, you go with micronutrients okay you give them micronutrients the seventh step is you will initiate feeding you will start giving feeds the next step is you will assess for catch-up growth so after starting feeding you will see whether there is any catch-up growth then you will give them sensory stimulation and after doing all this you will prepare them for follow-up you will prepare them for follow-up and discharge. So clear with the 10 steps of SAM, two hypos, hypoglycemia, hypothermia, then dehydration correction, then you give electrolytes, then treat infections, give micronutrients, start feeding, then assess for catch-up growth. Then you have to do sensory stimulation and follow-up. That's all. These are the 10 steps included in the treatment of SAM. Okay. Next question. Match the milestones. So one question from development is definitely coming in all the uh, three years if you have seen the pattern. Okay. So now try to match the milestone. The social milestone is one to two months. The first milestone a baby acquires a social smile. That is one to two months. Okay. Pincer grasp. What is pincer grasp? Yes, the baby is trying to hold something with the thumb and the index finger like this. Thumb and the index finger. That is called as mature pincer grasp. Before that, the child will try to hold it with the radial aspect like this, with the whole of the thumb and the finger. This is called as immature pincer grasp. And then the child will start holding it using mature pincer grasp. So pincer grasp is somewhere around 9 to 11 months. Okay. Reaches for objects. When will a child start to reach for objects? It is around 5 to 6 months. Walks 1 to steps is? By first birthday, the child will try to start walking. Just remember this. If you all seen the first birthday videos, you know, the child will try to walk. So walking uh, one, two steps is around one year. So 12 to 13 months. So this is the answer for this question. Now, coming to development. What are the laws of development? The first law of development is development is a continuous process. It happens throughout the life. So it is a continuous process. Second is sequence is same. But rate is different. What do you mean by that? Sequence is same means. So if a baby is uh, attaining head control followed by sitting with support and then walking means it is same in all babies. It, the sequence of events is not going to change. But the rate is different. Some babies, they attain head control by three months, some by four months, some by five months. So it is always a range. Clear? Sequence is same, but rate differs from baby to baby. The third thing, it is 
cephalocaudal in progression cephalocaudal means starts from head to the foot so head control then the baby will sit then the baby will stand then the baby will start walking this is cephalocaudal it cannot go reverse next is proximal to distal what is proximal to distal first the baby will have proximal milestones like reaching for objects all that and then fine distal movements like holding pencil scribbling all this comes in so it is the cephalocaudal proximal to distal clear and then all the mass disorganized movement will be replaced by definitive milestones okay initially everything will be disorganized and mass and then definitive milestones will occur okay the last point is all your neonatal reflexes has to be replaced by milestone so you would have heard about the neonatal reflexes the moro reflex asymmetric tonic neck reflex all this what happens in atn up when the baby is trying to turn to this side there will be extension of upper limb and lower limb on this side so if the baby is turning like this so this side is extending will the baby be able to blow lower no right so only when atn up disappears the baby will be able to roll over that is what is meant by all the neonatal reflexes has to be replaced by definite milestone clear so these six are the laws of development now we'll go to the development part what are the four important domains of development one is the gross motor fine motor social and adaptive language we'll just see the key milestones alone okay now see this baby we are going to see the same baby how the baby has been developing the first thing what is happening here baby is on prone position lifting head the first my gross motor is neck control when does neck control come neck control around 3 months next so what is the baby trying to do roll over yes roll over by 5 months then what is happening here the baby is sitting but with support sits with support when at 6 months remember this sits with support at 6 sits with support at 6 yes 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 don't forget okay sits with support at 6 and this is also called as tripod sign why have you all seen tripod so this is like a tripod can you see the baby is supporting and sitting like a tripod it's also called as tripod sign then sits without support when 8 months okay so after sitting without support the baby should start standing so see the baby is standing with support standing with support around 9 to 10 months what is this baby is holding on to furniture and trying to walk that is called as cruising what is cruising holding on to furniture and trying to walk so cruising around 11 months okay now coming to this in one photo the baby is lying on the ground the abdomen is on the ground the other photo the baby is abdomen is off the ground the first one is called as crawling crawling is abdomen on the ground on the ground on the ground okay the second one is called as creeping creeping is abdomen will be off the ground okay so just to remember this you'll have be you have a lot of confusion in this you remember commandos what do commandos do they crawl okay so commandos crawl abdomen on the ground is crawling abdomen off the ground is creeping okay so crawling around 8 months creeping around 10 months clear with this then so now the baby is standing without support and trying to take few steps so this is around 12 to 13 months so after this the baby should start running how when around 18 months the baby will start running and then climbing stairs so we have three parameters here one is the two feet per step so one feet it will keep another feet and then climb the next step one feet another feet so two feet per step in two years two 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 feet two years okay next is alternate feet going upward like this one feet one feet one feet alternate feet going upward is 3 years now the baby is above now it has to come down alternate feet going downwards it's 4 years clear 2 years 2 feet 3 years alternate up 4 years alternate down clear okay now right try cycle when does it try try cycle 3 years try 3 okay try cycle 3 years so this is the major gross motor milestone now coming to the fine motor fine motor milestone is one is the bidextrous reach using both the hands to reach for an object that is called as bidextrous reach around 4 months unidextrous is using only one hand to reach for an object around 6 months 
Now, what is this? This is only immature pincer. I already told you. Immature pincer is around eight months. This is mature pincer, holding with index and thumb finger. This is around eleven to twelve months. Clear? So fine motor. Now the baby is trying to write, starting to write and build blocks. So we will see this uh, simultaneously. So first one, scribbling. Imitate scribbling by eighteen months. Okay, by eighteen months, baby will imitate scribbling and be able able to build a block of three. Okay. Now next, vertical stroke. Vertical stroke by two years, and tower of six by two years. Okay. Next, circle. Circle when circle. Three years, okay. Three years is circle, and tower of nine by three years. After circle, putting cross at four years, and then rectangle at four and a half years, triangle at five years. Similarly, four and a half years able to build bridge, five years able to build gate. So this is about the fine motor milestone. So if you see here, can you see like this is somewhat like a scarecrow, right? The head of the crow, the uh, upper limb, and then the abdomen followed by limbs. So this looks like a scarecrow. You can remember this: three years, four years, five years. Okay, clear with this? This is fine motor. Okay. Now coming to the next one: social and adaptive and language. Social smile. I told you that is the first milestone a baby knows. So social smile is around two months. Recognizes mother by three months. Stranger anxiety is crying on seeing strangers. That is by six months. Bye bye. A baby says bye bye when nine months. So play simple ball game by one year. So if you see here, it is like three months, three months, three months. Okay, remember this. Then able to imitate household talk. When you go and sleep, no, the baby will also come and imitate that by eighteen months. Knows name and gender by three years. This is social. Now coming to language, cooing sound, oo ah sound, that kind of sound the baby makes around one to two months old itself. Okay, laughs out loud by four months. Monosyllables means ba, da, ba like that the baby will start speaking. That is around six months. Bi syllables means mama, dada, papa. So two words it will include. So nine months, nine months bi syllables. Okay, one to two words by one year, six to ten words by eighteen months. It will speak start speaking sentences by two years, rhymes by three years, stories by four years. So these are the language milestones. So if you just want to remember uh, key milestones, six year six months we saw try for question six with six six months. Then two years two feet per step. Then three years try cycle. Okay, you all remember this. I just tell you a small story for three years. Okay, so you just say that there's a boy. Uh, we're seeing a girl in the first floor. So, what the baby is able to identify gender. So, by three years, it will identify gender. And what is and he's impressed by the girl. So, what he wants to do is he want to go and impress by impress the girl. So, he just climbs the stairs. How two feet per step he goes. He climbs the stairs and then he rides a tricycle in a circle around that girl and he sings rhymes. But then the girl is not impressed. So, he is very sad and then goes very slowly down, alternate feet downward. Okay, can you understand this? So three years, able to know gender, able to know the name. He asks the name. He is able to climb, and then he is able to draw a circle with the tricycle, right tricycle, and comes downwards. Okay, so this is one story for three years old. So okay. coming to hand regard, what is hand regard? The child will know that it has some fingers and hand. It will start staring at its own fingers. That is called as hand regard. That is by Four months. What is razzing? It will start growing raspberries, like that. So that is called as razzing by five months. Then mouthing. What is mouthing? Whatever you give to the baby, the baby will keep it inside the mouth. That is called as mouthing. So mouthing is around six months. What is object permanence? Object permanence is when you hide something from the baby, the baby knows that that particular object is still present and will start trying to search for it. So that is called as object permanence or constancy. So it knows that the object is still present even after hiding. That is constancy. So you play peekaboo, right? You just close your eyes and say peekaboo. The baby will laugh. Why? Because the baby knows that you are behind that and you are going to come. 
that is around nine months. So peekaboo object permanence constancy is around nine months. Handedness. What is handedness? Preference to use a particular hand is called as handedness by three years. What is casting? Casting is nothing but when you give something, we will start throwing everything. That is casting around one year. So these are some of the milestones that could be asked in your exam. Okay, clear. So we are done with milestones. Now going to the next question. A 14-month-old with steroid-dependent nephrotic syndrome has come for immunization, which is true. You can give all vaccines. Yes, no, you cannot give live vaccines. Why? Because in steroid-dependent nephrotic syndrome, you're going to give long course of steroids. It is not short course. You're going to give long course of steroids. So the child is in an immunocompromised state. In those children, live vaccines are contraindicated. You can give only killed vaccine. Yes, you can give killed vaccine. Siblings cannot be given OPV. Yes, yes. So what happens? If you give OPV to siblings or household contacts of immunocompromised, there is a risk of VAP. What is VAP? Vaccine-associated paralytic polio. It can transmit to the immunocompromised child. So in household contacts, you are not supposed to give OPV. Next, pneumococcal vaccine is important prior to treatment. Yes. You give pneumococcal and varicella vaccine prior to the treatment for long course of steroid. So this is a multiple uh, option question. So all these three are true. Now coming to vaccination in special situations. Corticosteroid therapy. So when will you consider not to vaccinate corticosteroid therapy? When the dose of the oral steroid is more than 2 mg per kg per day or more than 20 mg per day, and taking for more than two weeks. Clear, two, 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 two milligram, 20 milligram per day, two weeks. If you if a child is taking steroid for only five days, it doesn't mean you have to not vaccinate. Only if this criteria is met, you will not give vaccine. Now what to do? After stopping for one month, one month, you give vac live vaccines. Killed vaccines can be given. For live vaccines, this is the protocol, okay? So one month after stopping steroids, you give vaccines. What about IVIG? Where do you give IVIG? Mostly for Kawasaki DP. So for IVIG, after 11 months, the cutoff period is 11 months. After 11 months only, you can give vaccines. What about cancer chemotherapy? After six months. Okay, here it is better not to give killed as well as live vaccines. The only vaccine that is approved or uh, that can be given during chemotherapy is your influenza. During chemotherapy is your influenza. Okay, otherwise all others are after six months. Next situation. Splenectomy. Okay, so in splenectomy, these children are prone to develop uh, infections caused by encapsulated organisms. What organisms? Encapsulated organisms. So you are supposed to give four vaccines for them. What are the vaccines? Pneumococcal, H influenza B, meningococcal, typhoid. These four vaccines has to be given for splenectomy patients. When to give? If you are going for a planned splenectomy, then two weeks before the procedure, you have to give. Suppose you are done an emergency splenectomy, you have to wait for two weeks. After two weeks of the procedure, only you have to give. Planned before two weeks. If it's emergency, after two weeks. Clear splenectomy. Now, baby is born to HIV positive mother. If a baby is born to HIV positive mother, what to do? Killed vaccine can be given. What about live vaccines? It depends on. Uh, it depends on whether the baby is symptomatic or asymptomatic. So, okay. So, if the baby is not having any symptoms, you call it as asymptomatic. So, what are the live vaccines you are supposed to give in HIV baby BCG? MMR, varicella, OP. Now, we'll see. What about BCG? BCG, asymptomatic, you can give. Symptomatic, do not give. Clear? MMR and varicella, asymptomatic, you can give. Symptomatic, if the CD4 count is more than 15 percentage, you can do. Okay. OPV, asymptomatic also you should not give. Symptomatic also you should not give. Then you should give IPV. Okay. You should prefer IPV here. And even for household contacts, you should prefer IPV. OPV should not be given in asymptomatic as well as symptomatic. Clear with HIV? Next. Preterm babies. So what about preterm babies? What are the vaccines we give at birth? Three vaccines we give, right? BCG, OPV. Hepatitis B. You can give BCG and OPV irrespective of the birth weight of the baby. For hepatitis B, less than 2 kg are not supposed to give hepatitis B. 
then when to give you wait for one month after birth or when the baby becomes more than 2 kg whichever is earlier okay more for one month or if the baby becomes more than 2 kg whichever is earlier this is about preterm now baby is born to hpsh age first to mother mother is hpsh age first to what to do first we'll see about a term baby what to do for a term baby you give hepatitis b vaccine okay you give vaccine plus hepatitis b immunoglobulin both has to be given within 12 hours of birth okay vaccine immunoglobulin within 12 hours of birth and then you follow the schedule for and give two more doses at one month and six month as per the schedule only total of three doses in term baby is enough whereas in pre term baby same you give vaccine plus immunoglobulin at birth and then you give extra three doses okay here two doses here extra three doses total of four doses this is the only difference between term and pre term okay special situation vaccination over now we'll go to the schedule so you have two schedules one is the national immunization schedule and next is the iap if you don't remember iap that is okay but national schedule you have to be by heart okay now i'm not going in detail about the schedule i'll just tell you some recent changes in the schedule that could be asked as a question so if you see here there is fipv at 6 weeks fipv at 14 weeks now recently since january 2023 we have added fipv third dose at 10 months this you should know third dose has been added at 10 months since jan 2023 okay so what is fipv fractionated ipv is fipv what is the difference between ipv and fipv ipv the dose is 0.5 ml in f means only a fraction we are taking so it is 0.1 ml ipv you give it intramuscular fipv you give it intradermal okay this is the difference fipv extra dose we are giving at 10 months since this year and one more thing you have to remember for 10 years and 16 years it is td and not tt it has been replaced long ago it is no, no longer tt it is td these two changes alone you remember okay fine what is this incovac incovac is the indigenous first world's intranasal covid vaccine that has been approved which is indigenous to india okay intranasal covid vaccine name is incovac produced by bharat biotech okay so this is approved for use in more than 18 years that is incovac okay so for more than 12 years we are giving two vaccines one is dipovax and corbivax these two are approved in children okay the next what is this servavac servavac is also a indigenous vaccine for hpv human papilloma virus produced by india it is quadrivalent or it is quadrivalent what are the strains 6 11 16 18 6 11 16 18 so it is used to prevent what cervical cancer clear servavac indigenous hpv vaccine quadrivalent so two new vaccines we have seen fine we'll move on to the next question decreasing order of mortality in neonates okay if you see what is the decreasing order see this chart this right side shows right side shows all the neonatal mortality okay so can we see what is the most common pre term pre term is the most common that is the first one then comes your infection sepsis the third is birth asphyxia the last is only congenital anomalies so what is the order here the first will be your pre term second will be your sepsis third will be your birth asphyxia fourth will be your congenital anomalies this is for neonatal mortality coming to under 5 mortality so under 5 mortality what is most common most common is pneumonia and diarrhea so pneumonia and diarrhea this you should know what are most common now coming to the rates what is the neonatal mortality rate what is the infant mortality rate and what is the under 5 mortality rate okay neonatal imr and under 5 so how much is this 22 28 35 per 1000 live births okay 22 28 35 clear next question in neonatal resuscitation which of the following is the most effective indicator of successful ventilatory effort so giving resuscitation what which 
uh, means that you are giving it properly. So, is it increase in heart rate, color change, chest movement, or chest rise? The answer here is rise in heart rate. The most effective indicator for successful regulation is heart rate, increase in heart rate. Which is the most important aspect, most important aspect of NRT. Ventilation. Ventilation is the most important aspect of neonatal resuscitation. And the most effective indicator is your rise in heart rate. Clear with this? Okay. Now coming to NRP. What is NRP? NRP is neonatal resuscitation program. So what to do? So if you see here, what are we doing in NRP? So we will do team briefing and equipment check before the birth of the baby. So before the birth of the baby, we will ask four pre-birth questions. Before birth, four questions. First question is, what is the gestation? Second question is, what about the color of the amniotic fluid? Amniotic fluid color. The third question is, any risk factors are there? Fourth question is about the umbilical cord management. What about umbilical cord management? There is a term called as delayed cord clamping. So you delayed cord clamping for at least 30 to 60 seconds after birth. You do not clamp the cord immediately. Delay for 30 to 60 seconds. So this you have to plan before birth. With the audition, are we going to delay or not? Okay. These are the four pre-birth questions. Now the baby is born. After the baby is born, what you will do? You will check for three things. First thing, whether the baby is a term baby or not. Okay. Second thing, whether the baby is actively crying or not. Third thing, whether the baby is having good muscle tone. Cry, muscle tone and term. If the answer is yes to all of these, you will take the baby to the mother's side. You will do the initial steps and give it to the mother. If the answer is no for any one of these, then you start doing your resuscitation initial steps. So what are the initial steps you do? Warm, dry, stimulate, uh, suction. Warm the baby, dry the baby, stimulate the baby, give suction. Now you see, now the baby is not crying even after that. Now what to do? You will start giving positive pressure ventilation. Clear? You will start giving positive pressure ventilation. So what is positive pressure ventilation? You give ventilation as well as pressure. So what are the things, instruments or the equipment that can be used? The first one is the self-inflating bag or nothing but your ambu bag. Self-inflating bag. The next one is the flow-inflating bag. The last one is something called as PP's resuscitator. So you can use either of these. So what is the indication for positive pressure ventilation? Baby not crying, not taking breath, not breathing. Or when heart rate is less than 100, you give positive pressure ventilation. What is the FIO2 you prefer here? For term babies, you start with 21%. For preterm babies, you start with 30% FIO2. Ventilation rate? 40 to 60 breaths per second, per minute, sorry. Ventilation pressure, 20 to 25 centimeter of water. Indicator of successful PPV, we are seeing increase in heart rate. So when you start giving PPV, the baby's heart rate will increase. So that means you're giving it properly. So what you do, 15 seconds, you start giving positive pressure ventilation. And then you check for the increase in heart rate. If heart rate is not increasing, you will go for something called as ventilative corrective measures. What are the ventilator corrective measures? You are checking whether you are giving ventilation properly. That is MR SOPA. Mnemonic is MR SOPA. M is adjust the mask. R is reposition the airway. S is suction and clear secretions. O is open the mouth and give ventilation. P is increase the pressure. A is alternate airway. Okay. So after 15 seconds, you are doing MR SOPA and you are doing it. Checking for the next 15 seconds. Then after that, if the baby is not uh, breathing, not uh, increase in heart rate means you will go for alternate method of airway. What are the alternate methods? Either you use laryngeal mask airway or you intubate the baby. Okay. So this is nothing but, what is this? Laryngoscope that is used in newborn. You can see here, this is a straight blade. It is not curved as an adult. It's a straight blade. And these are endotracheal tubes. So what is the indication? Even with PPV, the heart rate is not increased to 100. Not increased to 100 even after giving PPV for 30 seconds. You will intubate. What are the sizes you use ET tube? Less than 1 kg, less than 28 weeks. The size you use is 2.5. 1.1 to 2 kg, 28 to 34 weeks, you use 3. More than 2 kg, more than 34 weeks, you use 3.5. So this is the sizes preferred in newborn. Okay. Now, where will you insert? 
where will you insert the tube this measurement is called as ntl ntl means nose to tragus you measure the distance between the nasal septum to the tragus and add 1 cm to this so ntl plus 1 if it is around 5 means you add 1 cm 6 and you will fix the tube at 6 cm at the angle of the lip okay this is about intubation now next thing you are giving first pressure ventilation not getting corrected you start intubating the child even after 60 seconds of uh, 30 seconds of intubation and chest come uh, uh, post pressure ventilation still the baby is not breathing and heart rate is less than 60 what to do so if heart rate is less than 60 even after giving post pressure ventilation you will start chest compressions okay chest compression what is the depth at least one third of sternum should be compressed one third of sternum you use two thumb technique can you see two thumb technique compression rate is 3 is to 1 1 and 2 and 3 and breathe 1 and 2 and 3 and breathe that is how three compression one breath so it is 90 is to 30 in one minute total event is 120 so 120 events in one minute the ratio is 90 uh, chest compression 30 breaths clear fio2 is 100% so when you give post pressure ventilation it was 21 percentage but when you intubate and char- start giving chest compression you should increase the fio2 to 100% okay so when to stop when heart rate is more than 100 you stop chest compression continue with ventilation alone okay so this is about the chest compression so what are the drugs you can use epinephrine you can epinephrine uh, 1 mg per 10 ml is the those that is uh, dilution that is needed you can give intravenous or endotracheal intravenous is the preferred route okay the dose is 0.202 mg per kg if it's intravenous if it's endotracheal it is 0.1 mg per kg okay volume expanders if you suspect shock you use normal saline or o negative blood so the dose is 10 ml per kg thus thus remember this alone that is enough okay fine now coming to neonatal jaundice so what is neonatal jaundice there is increase in bilirubin due to immaturity of the baby's liver so how do you assess there is something called as kramer scale kramer scale is the dermal zones of jaundice you will blanch the skin and see for ichthyosis so the zone 1 is here up to the neck zone 2 is this trunk zone 3 is the thighs and the arms zone 4 is legs and the four arms zone 5 is palms and soles so if if it's zone 1 the value will be somewhere around 4 to 6 mg per deciliter in zone 2 the value would be somewhere around 6 to 8 in zone 3 the value would be somewhere around 8 to 10 mg per deciliter in zone 4 the value would be somewhere around 10 to 12 mg per deciliter and in zone 5 it is more than 15 mg per deciliter clear this is cramer scale this you have to know what is this this is transcutaneous bilirubin meter transcutaneous bilirubin meter to assess the neonatal jaundice okay now what is the treatment for neonatal jaundice you give phototherapy so this is phototherapy can you see this is phototherapy this one is called as billy blanket what is billy blanket billy blanket means portable phototherapy okay so what is the chart used to assess phototherapy when to give or not that is called as butani nomogram okay butani nomogram what is the wavelength that should be used 460 to 490 nanometer distance between the baby and the phototherapy unit should be around 30 to 35 cm irradiance is somewhere around 10 microwatts per cm square per nanometer okay for 460 to 490 nanometer wavelength distance 30 to 35 cm ray irradiance is 10 microwatts so what are the three mechanisms of phototherapy first one is structural isomerization which is the most important method structural isomerization here bilirubin is converted to what bilirubin is converted to lumirubin and it is excreted bilirubin to lumirubin second method photo isomerization what happens in photo isomerization z isomers are converted to e isomers last one is photo oxidation which is a minor part three important mechanism you should know then yeah. precautions to be taken you should cover the eyes of the baby you should cover the genitals of the baby what are the adverse effects 
chances of dehydration, skin rashes, and bronze baby syndrome. What is bronze baby syndrome? So, if you use phototherapy for conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, you will get bronze baby syndrome. So, you should use it only for unconjugated. Suppose if you use it for conjugated, you get bronze baby syndrome. What is intensive phototherapy? So, you give it intensively. So, what you do? You will increase the irradiance to 30 microwatts and you will reduce the distance between the baby to around 20 to 25 centimeters. You will reduce the distance and you can use one or two units like double surface phototherapy and all. Double surface means above the baby you keep one unit, below the baby you keep one unit. That is double surface phototherapy. So, we have done phototherapy. Next. Best alternative to mother's breast milk in low birth weight babies. So, low birth weight preterm babies, the first thing is always, always, always breast milk. Okay, it is always breast milk. Clear? So, if you don't have breast milk, what will you use here? You can use what? You can use donor breast milk. So, that would be the answer here. So, feeding low birth weight babies. How to feed low birth weight babies? So, less than 28 weeks, you give IV fluid. 28 to 32 weeks, you can give feeds through NG tube or orogastric tube. 32 to 34 weeks, you can give feeds to Pala day. Pala day feeding. And more than 34 weeks, you can give direct breastfeeding. You can give direct breastfeeding. Okay, clear? This is feeding of low birth weight babies. What is this? Kangaru mother care. Kangaru mother care, what are the three components of Kangaru mother care? First one is you will initiate it early. Initiate Kangaru mother care early. Second is you continue breastfeeding. Continue breastfeeding. Third is early discharge. So these three are the components of Kangaru mother care. Okay. Now, neonatal seizures. This is also a repeat. What are the types of neonatal seizures? You have subtle seizures. You have tonic, clonic, myoclonic. Subtle seizure, most common. Myoclonic, worst prognosis. Okay. What are the causes? Most common causes, HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, most common. Other causes, a metabolic life, hypocalcemia, hypoglycemia, hyponatremia, hypomagnesemia, four hypos. Infections, meningitis, neonatal sepsis caused by group B, streptococci, nothing but streptococci, agalactiae, staph, listeria. These are the common organisms. Other causes, inborn errors of metabolism and pyridoxine deficiency. This causes refractive seizures in children, babies. Okay, pyridoxine deficiency. Okay, and what is fifth day seizures? Fifth day seizures is benign neonatal epilepsy is called as fifth day seizures. Benign neonatal epilepsy. Okay, new one is over. Next. So parents notice that the child is tired. Notice that he feels shortness of breath on climbing stairs in supine position. So there is dyspnea on exertion. And supine position, there, it means what is that? It's called as orthopnea. So there is orthopnea. So what is the first investigation you do whenever a child is having dyspnea on exertion and orthopnea? The first thing you will suspect is congenital heart disease. So to rule out congenital heart disease, the first investigation you do is echo. Clear? Okay. Now, which of the following cyanotic heart disease has increased pulmonary blood flow? Okay, now we'll see. So, we will divide heart disease into acyanotic and cyanotic. Acyanotic, you all know, the shunt is left to right. In left to right shunts, you will not have cyanosis. So, that is acyanotic. Coming to cyanotic heart disease, what is happening? We'll go with this box heart. There is right to lung. Right to left shunt. Okay, the shunt is right to left. So there is mixing of deoxygenated blood, deoxygenated blood, and oxygenated blood. So what happens? What happens? So there is cyanosis. Okay, so there is cyanosis. So right to left shunt, there is cyanosis. So the systemic circulation gets deoxygenated blood. So here you will divide them into two categories. One is decreased pulmonary blood flow and Increased pulmonary blood flow. 
so this you all know right side of the heart is going right ventricle is going to pulmonary veins pulmonary veins is going to the lungs okay so now what happens sorry uh, right side goes to the pulmonary artery pulmonary artery goes to the lungs and then from the lungs pulmonary vein comes to the left atrium this your fear right so whenever there is some problem in the right side of the heart in this side if you have some problem the pulmonary blood flow is going to reduce so what are the problem either it can be a atresia of the wall tricuspid atresia or it can be at least of the pulmonary wall right ventricle outflow obstruction where do you see in top tetralogy of fallet you see right ventricular obstruction then epstein anomaly what is epstein anomaly atrialization of right ventricle is called as epstein anomaly these three conditions pulmonary blood flow is decreased increased pulmonary blood flow is pga transperson of great arteries pa pvc and truncus arteriosus these three conditions pulmonary blood flow is increased okay so what is the answer here cyanotic heart disease with increased pulmonary blood flow fc no it is decreased top no it is decreased tga tapc so the answer is 3 and 4 okay now coming to this question 11 year old child with acute traumatic fever and no cardiac pathology what is the penicillin prophylaxis okay acute traumatic fever no cardiac pathology no cardiac pathology. the answer is 5 years okay Now coming to rheumatic fever criteria. Rheumatic fever criteria is called as what? Revised or modified Jones criteria. Okay. So here you divide them based on what? The risk group. Low risk and high risk population. Low risk is based on the rheumatic fever incidence and rheumatic heart disease prevalence. Okay. When incidence is less than 2 per 1 lakh population, you call it as low risk. when incidence is more than 2 per 1 lakh population you call it as high risk rhd prevalence less than 1 per 1000 cases you call it as low more than 1 per 1000 cases you call it as high so rf rhd this you have to know major criteria five what are the major criteria polyarthritis polyarthritis then carditis erythema marginatum then Poria, then subcutaneous nodules. These five are the major criteria. So, if you see here in high risk population, even if poly arth uh, mono arthritis is present, you will go with criteria mono arthritis. So, low risk poly arthritis in moderate high risk mono arthritis is enough. Otherwise, carditis is the same, erythema marginatum same, poria same, subcutaneous nodule same. Only difference is. instead of polyarthritis mono arthritis is enough similarly minor criteria what are the minor criteria polyarthralgia fever more than 38.5 degree centigrade esr more than 60 mm crp more than 3 and increased pr interval these five are minor criteria so what is the difference in high risk population mere presence of mono arthralgia is enough Doesn't mean you need polyarthralgia. Monoarthralgia is enough. Fever, if it's more than thirty-eight degree, that is enough. ESR, if it is more than thirty millimeter, that is enough. CRP and PR interval are the same. So this is the difference between low risk and high risk population. Okay. Now, what is essential criteria? Evidence of streptococcal infection, either ASO titer or throat swab. Throat swab positive for streptococcus. These are essential criteria. so how will you diagnose one major two major or one major two minor this is plus essential criteria has to be there okay that is why it's essential in case of recurrence same or even three minor you can take it as rheumatic fever okay clear two major one major plus two minor okay coming to treatment of rheumatic fever it is mainly what bed rest and penicillin and suppressive therapy when to give suppressive therapy if there is no carditis mean you give aspirin that is enough in uh, ccf or without ccf you will go to corticosteroids chorea management you can use haloperidol okay for chorea management or carbamazepine 
now coming to the prevention this is only important primary prevention is preventing the occurrence of disease by hand hygiene all that secondary prevention is streptococcal infection has occurred now you have to prevent rheumatic fever how to prevent rheumatic fever in already a patient who has got rheumatic fever so you see whether it is without carditis with carditis or rheumatic arthritis if there is no carditis then you give for 5 years or when the child becomes 18 years of age whichever is later 5 years or 18 years okay you if carditis you give for 10 years or till 25 years of age whichever is later if it's an established rheumatic heart disease or you're giving doing some surgery then you have to give lifelong prophylaxis this is the criteria so what you give you give benzathione penicillin or you can give oral penicillin also benzathione penicillin is preferred okay this is important for rheumatic fever prophylaxis now coming to the next question a uh, 18 month old baby with choking so examination reveals decreased air entry in left lung so this is a classical case of what foreign body aspiration so now what to do chest x ray ct chest bronchoscopy icd so you all know this is a multiple option question so chest x ray if it needed yes why to diagnose to know where the foreign body is chest x ray is needed ct chest no it is not needed bronchoscopy yes you need bronchoscopy for removal of the foreign body icd insertion no it is used only for pneumothorax or effusion something like that not for foreign body per se so the answer is chest x ray and bronchoscopy now see this location of foreign body how to identify where the foreign body is the first image you can see this is a circle in the ap view we are doing an ap view you are seeing a coin it is flat so this is an esophagus how to remember esophagus o oh, o oh, esophagus whereas when it is in the trachea this looks like a t transverse so if it's like an o it's esophagus if it's like a t in uh, ap view it is trachea okay location of foreign body is over now come to the next image if you see the first image you can see it is absolutely normal right both the lung fields are normal whereas in the second image you can see there is some hyperinflation in the left side of the lung alone so this is nothing but inspiratory and expiratory film So inspiratory film is normal. Expiratory film there is hyperinflation on one side. This is classical of a partial obstructing foreign body in the bronchi. So foreign body in the bronchi can either obstruct completely, can cause complete obstruction, or it can cause partial obstruction. If it's complete obstruction, you will have collapse of the lung because air cannot go in, cannot come out. So the lung is going to collapse. In partial obstruction, what is happening? This creates a ball valve effect so this is the foreign body this creates a ball valve effect what happens air can go in during inspiration and it will cause the lung to uh, inflate but it cannot go out air cannot go out it can, it can come in but it cannot go out that is called as ball valve effect in partial obstruction it will cause hyperinflation that is why inspiratory and expiratory film is needed to diagnose foreign body okay now coming to the treatment of foreign body so now what to do when a child is choking in front of you the first thing you see is whether the child is conscious or unconscious if the baby is unconscious you will start doing cpr and then you will try to uh, review the baby rescue the baby and then only treat for foreign body okay if the baby is conscious you have to see what is the age of the baby if the baby is an infant less than 1 year you do this technique five back blows followed by chest compression five times you give back blows and then five chest compressions this is for infants if its baby is more than 1 year of age you do something called as hemlich's maneuver what is this hemlich's maneuver abdominal thrust you are giving hemlich's maneuver it is a conscious baby if the baby is unconscious you are going to do cpr and then breathe okay clear this is about foreign body removal then bronchoscopy bronchoscopy flexible bronchoscopy is for diagnosis remember this flexible bronchoscopy is for diagnosis and rigid bronchoscopy is for removal of foreign body okay clear now next question bronchial asthma it what is bronchial asthma you all know edema inflammation of the mucous membrane 
excessive secretion of mucus and spasm of smooth muscle all this is causing what narrowing and obstruction of the airway so a bronchial asthma is an obstructive disease how to diagnose pulmonary function test using spirometry fev1 by fec if what is fev1 forced expiratory volume at 1 yes that is fev1 forced vital capacity is fvc you do the ratio if it is less than 80 percentage or less than 0.8 it is asthma the second parameter bronchodilator response child is having asthmatic attack you give a bronchodilator you give short acting beta agonist saba and then you see the response if the increase in response is more than 20 percentage if fev1 is more than 12 percentage after bronchodilator it is a criteria so exercise challenge you do exercise and what will happen it will worsen so after exercise if the worsening is more than 15 percentage it is diagnostic of asthma last diurnal variation am and pm variation if the variation is more than 20 percentage peak expiratory flow rate you have to do if it's more than 20 percentage it is asthma so 12 15 20 remember what is this i think but pheno what is pheno fractional exhale concentration of nitric oxide fractional exhale concentration of nitric oxide if it is more than 20 parts per billion it is diagnostic of asthma okay now coming to the inhalation devices so inhalation devices what are the devices you can use for giving inhalation first thing what is this this is a mask with spacer with meter dose inhaler this you use for babies less than for years the second one what is that it is a spacer mask is not there spacer plus meter dose inhaler this is used for children from 4 to 12 years this is what is this last one is only meter dose inhaler you don't use spacer or face mask for children more than 12 years you can use so less than 4 years 4 to 12 years more than 12 years these are the inhalation devices next what to do with acute exacerbation of asthma child comes with acute exacerbation of asthma which of the following would you do chest x ray no chest x ray is not needed for diagnosis of asthma child is sick so what to do oxygen yes any illness any emergency abc is first airway breathing circulation next back to back salbutamol nebulization yes oral corticosteroids yes all this you have to take now how to treat acute exacerbation when the child can come to you with either mild symptoms or acute severe symptoms life threatening asthma so in mild symptoms you give nebulizations and send home and review okay whereas in severe symptoms and life threatening symptoms there will be what there will be side and chest there will be fall in saturation saturation will be low and then the child can have cyanosis shock all these can be there so what to do in them a b c is first so airway breathing you give oxygen and then you correct shock okay so first is a b c then you go for salbutamol nebulization how much back to back 30 minutes every back to back nebulization you give three nebulizations you give okay then you give oral steroids you look for response if the child is responding you stop oxygen and decrease the salbutamol to 4 to 6 hours if improving if not improving child is deteriorating what you do you will give ipratropium nebulization then you will give iv hydrocortisone okay still not improving what to do what to do you will give iv theophylline still not improving you will give iv max self magnesium sulfate still not improving you will put the patient on mechanical ventilation clear so this is the treatment of acute exacerbation of asthma okay cystic fibrosis this is also a very important topic cystic fibrosis what is the inheritance autosomal recessive what is the genetics genetics is cftr mutation which is the most common mutation here deletion of phenyl alanine deletion of phenyl alanine at 508840 position is the most common mutation features you will have respiratory features gi features and other features coming to respiratory features bronchiolitis is the earliest one earliest lung pathology is bronchiolitis and then you can you can have bronchic cases all this next what are the infections that is common staph pseudomonas burkholderia these three are causing recurrent infections gi it can start from meconiomelias 
still biliary fibrosis anything can happen other features hyponatremic hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis you have to remember and azeus permea why because there is atresia of the ulfian duct structures all your vas deferens epididymis and all they become atresia so you will have azeus permea and male infertility okay coming to the diagnosis so what is diagnosis presence of typical features so it should be either one of these features or history of cystic fibrosis in a sibling or a positive newborn test this should be there okay any one among this should be there plus lab evidence what are the lab evidence you do a test called as sweat chloride test so when you do sweat chloride test if the value is more than 60 mini equivalents it is positive then you do a mutation study or abnormal nasal potential difference any one among these one from clinical feature one from lab feature as the leader okay now coming to the treatment you have something called as cftr regulator modifiers okay modulators what are what are they evacaptor lumacaptor tezacaptor these are what cftr modulators evacaptor lumacaptor tezacaptor okay this is about cystic fibrosis now the next stop the child presents with sphenomegaly and hemolytic facies investigations to be done so sphenomegaly hemolytic facies this is characteristic of what some hemolytic anemia could be thalassemia we don't know so here what you do you do peripheral smear and then you do hplc okay these two are indicated pta pdt is only for bleeding manifestations bone marrow is for something it's not for this so when you suspect hemolytic anemia first thing you do is peripheral smear followed by electrophoresis hplc okay what is thalassemia because of problem in the globin chain rotation it should be it can be alpha thalassemia or beta thalassemia when there is less uh, alpha chain protection you call it as alpha thalassemia when there is less beta chain protection you call it as beta thalassemia most common is beta thalassemia okay here you can see what the chipmunk facies maxillary hyperplasia is seen right this is called as chipmunk facies and then in next stage skull you have something called as aron and appearance aron and appearance these are features of thalassemia now coming to the peripheral smear in peripheral smear you can see microcytic hypochromic rbcs anisopoikilocytosis what aniso poikilo cytosis then target cells what are target cells can you see here? these are target cells like a target so these are target cells and basophilic stippling these are peripheral smear pictures of thalassemia okay now next is hemoglobin electrophoresis what happens is that hba adult hemoglobin is what constitute the major part of our hemoglobin adult hemoglobin is made up of alpha 2 and beta 2 strains okay so you know beta 2 is affected so what is going to happen hba is going to reduce and other hemoglobins are going to increase so when you have an hbf fetal hemoglobin peak you that is a major thalassemia thalassemia major okay whereas when you have a peak in the hba2 hba2 peak then it is thalassemia free clear f peak is major a to peak is thalassemia free okay iron overload what is the most important indicator of iron overload it is the liver iron content how to measure it it is r2 mra of the liver that is the most important thing other methods is you can measure serum ferritin or you can measure the cardiac iron overload cardiac iron overload what are the chelators you know three chelators what are they desferoxamine deferiprone deferoserox desferoxamine is iv or subcutaneous deferiprone and deferoserox are oral iron chelators okay so this is about iron overload in thalassemia coming to bleeding when a child presents to you with bleeding it could be either platelet disorder or it could be a coagulation disorder how to differentiate in a platelet disorder it will be mostly skin and mucosal bleeding skin bleeding and mucosal bleeding in a coagulation disorder the bleeding is mostly joint bleeding muscle bleeding okay 
and then in platelet disorders petechiae or common whereas in coagulation disorders petechiae are not common you will see hematrhosis and hematomas clear this is how you differentiate whether it's platelet or coagulation now coming to hemophilia what is hemophilia it is an inherited disorder what inheritance x linked what is the inheritance it is an x linked recessive so it is seen only in males Hemophilia A is factor VIII deficiency. Hemophilia B is factor IX deficiency, also called as Christmas disease. Features I told you joint bleed. So hematrosis is hallmark. They will have joint bleed, hematrosis, and other organ bleeding also. Sometimes very severely intracranial bleeding. How will you treat? Factor replacement. So treatment is factor replacement. Clear? No. We'll continue. 11 month old boy presents with recurrent infections atopic dermatitis and petechiae platelet count is 20000 what is this classical triad classical triad of recurrent infections eczema like lesions and thrombocytopenia this is nothing but wiscott aldrich syndrome wiscott aldrich syndrome this you have to remember So, what is the screening test you do? Screen for vast gene expression. So, Wiscott Aldrich syndrome, triad of recurrent infection, eczema, and thrombocytopenia. Here, if you see in the peripheral smear, you will have small platelets. Small platelets is characteristic of Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. Okay. Now, coming to leukemias. So, leukemias sometimes they have asked in previous questions. So, what is the most common uh, leukemia? ALM. Most common is ALN. Okay, what are the types you have? Free B cell, free T cell, and mature B cell. This is most common. Next comes T cell. Mature B cell is very less, one to two percentage. Clear? So how will you diagnose bone marrow? Bone marrow. If more than twenty five percent blast cells are seen, you call it as ALN. Coming to the poor prognosis, this is very important. You have to memorize this. When do you say there is poor prognosis? Age less than one year or more than ten years. Male six. Leukocyte count more than fifty thousand cells. Features like hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, mediastinal involvement, and CNS involvement. Okay. Type. What type? If it's a mature B, I told it is rare, right? If it's a mature B cell, it has Poor prognosis and diploidy, hypo diploidy. Last cytogenetic. Okay, translocation nine twenty two, translocation eight fourteen, translocation four eleven. These three have poor prognosis. So this is very important. You have to know. Coming to the treatment, you have four phases. Induction, prophylactically, you have to give CNS treatment. You give methotrexate intrathecally. Consolidation phase and maintenance phase. So four phases are there. This is about AML. Now coming to AML. So AML is the second most common leukemia in children. So AML, how you diagnose? When bone marrow is more than twenty percent blast cells, you diagnose AML. So what is this? This is FAB classification of AML. You have seven types. So this in this you have to remember type three promyelocytic is associated with DIC. Okay. Type four is associated with gum hypertrophy. Okay, type three DIC, type four gum hypertrophy, and in AML you can see something called as chloromas. What are chloromas? Accumulation of the myeloblasts in the skin or some uh, tissues called as chloroma. Okay, this is characteristic of AML. Now, congenital CMV infection. This is also very very important. They are asked repeatedly. So congenital CMV infection is the most common congenital infection. Okay, so uh, which is common? Primary infection or reactivation? Reactivation is common. Though primary infection is more, reactivation is common that is causing congenital infection. So the risk of transmission is if it's going to be a primary infection or reactivation, it is ten percent in case of primary infection. If it's going to be reactivation, it is very less. But then the most common route is reactivation only. Ten percent of the babies will be symptomatic. All others will be asymptomatic. Okay, this is about CMV. What are the features of CMV? Microcephaly, hepatosplenomegaly, petechiae, then 
sensory neural hearing loss and most importantly calcifications what calcifications periventricular periventricular calcifications can you see here around the ventricles you see calcification that's for this okay how will you diagnose you do urine pcr for cmv that is diagnostic of cmv treatment is gani cyclovir okay so this is about congenital cmv infection next west syndrome what is west syndrome triad of west syndrome infantile spasm also known as salam spells then psychomotor regression then what is this eeg finding hip arrhythmia this can you see some chaotic waves that is called as hip arrhythmia triad okay this is west syndrome triad what is the treatment of west syndrome acth or oral steroids or vigabatrin all these can be used as treatment for west syndrome okay next febrile seizures okay, what is the most common age group of febrile seizures 6 months to 6 years okay you will divide them into simple febrile and complex febrile simple simple is when it is generalized complex is when it is focal next when it's less than 15 minutes is simple more than 15 minutes this complex okay then if it occurs within 24 hours of fever it is simple if it occurs more than 24 hours of fever it is complex this you have to know next is risk factor for recurrence this is straight from nelson the major criteria is when age is less than 1 year duration of fever less than 24 hours when the fever is 38 to 39 that is major minor family history of seizure family history of epilepsy complex seizure when the baby is a ba uh, male baby and low serum sodium level so these are minor risk factors okay next coming to status epilepticus when do you call it as status epilepticus when the seizure is for more than 5 minutes you call it as status epilepticus what to do any emergency i told you what is that abc so airway breathing circulation first next what to do you will give injection lorazepam or midazolam two doses up to two doses next not settling then you can go to phenytoin or phosphenytoin okay then not settling two doses of phenytoin phosphenytoin you can give sodium valproate not settling then you can give levetiracetam still not settling then you will go to phenobarbitone not settling with phenobarbitone then what what you have to give you can give you can give what midazolam continuous infusions you can give midazolam continuous infusions then also not settling then you can use some general anesthetics like propofol and thiopental the last is ketamine okay so this is the treatment of status epilepticus okay now next question 14 year old child presented with firm non tender slow growing swelling in the left side of the neck okay noted to have axillary circles pigmented flat spot on tongue what is that this could be cacciolase spots this could be axillary circle what about this swelling this could be a neuro fibroma so what is the diagnosis it is neuro fibromatosis coming to neurocutaneous markers neuro fibromatosis is characterized by neuro fibromas second axillary circles then cacciolase spots then stenot dysplasia then optic glioma and leash nodules in the iris so these are features of neurofibromatosis it is an autosomal dominant condition remember this now coming to this what is this you can see what is this adenoma sebaceum something on the nose then here you can see what ash leaf macules and you can also see shag green patch in the ct you can see q 
tubers, cortical tubers. What is this? This is tuberous sclerosis. This is tuberous sclerosis. Okay. Now, this is also a repeat question. Male present with fatigue, muscle joint pain, examination, characteristic rashes. What are these? These are called as gotran papules. Gotran papules, characteristic of juvenile dermatomyositis. What are the other features of JDM? Heliotrope rash. Heliotrope rash and shawl sign. 